Right, good morning everybody. Uh, my name's Tom Raines. I'm the head of the Europe programme here at Chatham House. Delighted to welcome you all to this uh, Brexit-focused event this morning. A um, couple of uh, just bits of housekeeping before we introduce the discussion and the panel today. Um, this is being live streamed for all our panel participants and everyone in the audience. So there's a camera at the back, so uh, please bear that in mind. This discussion is on the record, not under the Chatham House rule. And in fact, the intention here is to spark a wider conversation about this topic. So for that reason, you can also tweet about the discussion, use uh, the hashtag CH events, but please put your phone on silent. So the subjects of uh, this morning's discussion, we, we were discussing the title, we came up with uh, Towards a National Compromise, the Common Market 2.0. Um, and I suppose in some ways this is a very well-timed discussion given the remarkable tumultuous politics of the moment, but at the same time it's a sort of terribly timed discussion because we're leaving in nine days and we don't have a national compromise at the moment. Um, the PM's due to head to Brussels tomorrow. Um, there's an extension letter being drafted or being, being dispatched at the moment. We know Parliament has rejected the deal twice. The Speaker has rejected Parliament rejecting the deal or accepting the deal a third time. Parliament has rejected no deal. So the list of options is growing thinner in terms of a positive uh, agenda for what Parliament can accept, what a consensus and a majority can support. Um, this morning we have a group of MPs from different parties who have come to talk about their proposal for how we move through this impasse, how we break the gridlock that we find ourselves in. Um, and I'm just going to introduce them before we get into the, the substance of uh, Common Market 2.0. So on my right is Stephen Kinnock. He's the MP for Aberavon, 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 Aberavon. <laughs> forgive me, uh, since 2015. Uh, Labour MP, as the surname implies, um, previously worked at the World <laughs> Economic Forum. Good, good think tank credentials there. Uh, Nick Bowles, also formerly a think tanker, in fact, um, has been the MP for Grantham and Stamford since 2010, I believe. Um, Conservative MP. Uh, Lucy Powell is the MP for Manchester Central. Um, used to work for Ed Miliband before becoming MP in 2012. And um, Robert Halfen is the MP for Harlow, also the chair of the Education Select Committee and a former deputy chairman of the Conservative Party. Um, so Stephen is going to introduce Common Market 2.0. Um, he's going to give a short overview um, of what it means. Uh, what some of the pros, the cons, the strengths, the limitations, and then we have a chance um, both on the panel and as an audience to really um, get to grips with what it means. This is a uh, really, I think, a valuable opportunity for us to try to really understand the detail of what is a, a complex arrangement, but potentially um, a way forward that a majority can, can support. So Stephen, over to you. Thank you very much. Well. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, Nick, Robin, and everybody else at Chatham House for organizing this event. I would also just like to say uh, thanks to my fellow panelists uh, today. We are a motley crew, you might say, um, but it's been a real pleasure and a privilege uh, to work with you and with colleagues from uh, our, our parties in, in our wider group, the Common Market 2.0 group. Uh, I'm really proud of the way that we've left our narrow party political tribalism aside uh, in order to try to work in the national interest uh, and in the spirit of compromise that I think this meeting is all about today. Thanks also to you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming along today so early in the morning for what I hope will be an informative uh, conversation about our proposal. We call it Common Market 2.0. Michel Barnier likes to call it Norway Plus. But either way, we think it's the best way forward that can win parliamentary support and that can begin to reunite our deeply divided country. Now, someone once told me that the beginning of a speech should always contain a surprise for the audience, something that will really make them sit up and take notice. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to start today by telling you that I completely agree with Nigel Farage. <laughs> yes. I agree with Nigel, who in 2016 said the following to a BBC Question Time audience two months before the referendum vote. I hear people say, this is my best Nigel Farage impression, uh, I hear people say, wouldn't it be terrible 
if we were like Norway or Switzerland. They are rich, they're happy, and they're self-governing countries. And I also absolutely agree with Nigel's fellow Brexiteer, the MEP Daniel Hannan, who said, Norway and Switzerland. I can't help thinking they're doing pretty well. And if that wasn't enough of a surprise for you, I'd like to add that I concur entirely with their pal, the Tory Brexiteer MP Owen Paterson, who in 2015 said only a madman would actually leave the market. Now, whilst you might find my budding bromance with the bad boys of Brexit quite amusing, there is actually a deadly serious reason for me sharing those quotes with you. Because what they demonstrate is that in 2016, Euroscepticism meant something that it apparently no longer means today. Today, Euroscepticism means setting off into the Brexit fantasy forest of unicorns and rainbows. Yet in 2016, Euroscepticism simply meant being, oppo being opposed to political integration whilst cheerleading for the single market. It meant keeping the strong, mutually beneficial economic ties whilst defending the nation state as the primary source of political power and accountability. And that, in a nutshell, is what Common Market 2.0 is all about. Theresa May's interpretation of the referendum result spelled the end of the pragmatic Euroscepticism of 2016 and replaced it with a brand of isolationism that has only, not only been deeply counterproductive for the Brexit negotiations, it has also profoundly damaged our country's reputation on the global stage. The fact is that 5248 is not a mandate to remain in the EU, EU and carry on with business as usual, but neither is it a call for a hard Canada-style Brexit, and it certainly isn't a call for leaving with no deal. The referendum result must be seen as a call to leave the EU's ever, ever deeper political integration, whilst maintaining a strong, close and productive economic relationship with those 500 million consumers on our doorstep. In short, the referendum result is an instruction from the British people to move house, but to stay in the same neighbourhood. So, what does Common Market 2.0 actually ensure? of the political declaration on the future relationship, which the EU are open to amend amending. It does not require any change to the 580-page withdrawal agreement, which the EU has made crystal clear is sealed shut. The rewriting of the political declaration would specify an e UK-EU future relationship whereby the e UK maintains full participation in the European economic area by joining the EEA's European Free Trade Association pillar. EFTA is a government, intergovernmental organization that promotes free trade and economic integration without political or monetary union. The EEA's single market is essentially an extension of the EU's internal market beyond the EU28 to also cover the three EFTA states that are signed up to the EEA, namely Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein. Due to the issues with the Irish border, during the transition phase, which is due to end in December 2020, although, of course, now with this, the extension, that, may, that will, could well change, the UK will need to negotiate on its succession to EFTA, a derogation that will allow us to negotiate with the EU a comprehensive customs arrangement, including the common external tariff, unless and until alternative arrangements to secure frictionless trade on the Irish border can be agreed. A major strength of Common Market 2.0 is that it is by far the fastest route to Brexit and therefore attractive to those MPs and to the wider public who are desperate to get on with it, whilst at the same time removing almost all the risk of the Irish backstop ever having to come into play. It also recognises that a permanent customs union is not strictly necessary. Common Market 2.0 would give the UK full membership of the single market which the UK helped to create, and which in underpins so many British businesses trading success. But we would leave the EU's political institutions, leave the jurisdiction of the ECJ, of the common agriculture and fishery policies, and the EU's drive towards ever closer union. We would also increase our power to control free freedom of movement. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Crucially, it is an option that is popular with voters, 
whenever myself, Lucy, Rob, or Nick are out on the doorstep in, in Aberavon, Manchester, Harlow, or Grantham, we hear the same message time and again from our older voters. We voted for a common market back in the 1970s. We did not vote for all this political stuff. In the 1970s and 1980s, the British people broadly supported our membership of the European Economic Community because it delivered clear economic benefits to British business and workers. It was only ever as the ever closer political union took hold that the paths of the United Kingdom and the European Union began to diverge. And that, I think, dates from the Maastricht Treaty. A newly founded UK-EU common market for the 21st century would respect the public desire for striking the right balance between political sovereignty and economic integration. It would recast our country's relationship with the EU in a way that would better reflect our history, geography, and politics. Common, common Market 2.0 should also be seen as a reset moment for Europe. Popular consent for the European project is under threat. And Macron was right recently to talk about Europe's future being one of several circles. He said, we have to build a Europe with several formats to go further with those who want to go forward without being hindered by those states that want, as is their right, to go not as fast or as far. That is absolutely the right strategy. There are several European countries that will never join the Euro, that will never sign up to a European army, and that have deep reservations about the free movement of labor. The creation of a, an outer ring of non-EU countries that participate in the single market but opt out of ever deeper political integration would be a huge step in the right direction. And the UK could play a central role in that outer circle. Now, let's turn our attention to one or two of the elephants in the room, one or two of the myths, if you like, that have been circulating about Common Market 2.0. Let's start with one that I alluded to earlier, that it, Common Market 2.0 means no uh, changes on free movement of labor. Yes, it's true that the free movement of labor would continue initially under Common Market 2.0, but there would be a marked improvement in our position in that we could apply the safeguard measures that are written into the EEA agreement. These safeguards give a qualified but unilateral right to any of the EFTA EEA members under Article 112 of the EEA agreement to suspend freedom of movement if that country believes it is suffering serious societal or economic difficulties. We would then be able to renegotiate freedom of movement under Article 113, perhaps based on regional or industry quotas. But if negotiations were to break down, we could not be forced to reopen our borders. Article 114 allows retaliation from the other single market countries, but this reaction would have to be reciprocal. They could not, for instance, respond to our decision to suspend the free movement of labor by suspending our exports of goods or services to them. These measures are clearly not to be used lightly, but the Article 112 and 113 safeguard measures could help to ease our public's existing fears about the seeming, seemingly limitless nature of free movement of labor. The second myth is that the UK would become a rule taker. This is simplistic, and it ignores the fact that under the terms of Common Market 2.0, the UK would be leaving the European Court of Justice and thereby ending the principle of direct, the direct effect of EU law. The EFTA court that the UK would join respects national sovereignty in a way that the ECJ doesn't. Plus, we would have one out of four EFTA court judges rather than the one out of 28 that we currently have on the ECJ. Under EEA lawmaking, the EFTA nations have a right to be consulted by the EU at a technical level. And once a directive has become law, it is passed on to the EEA Joint Committee, on which the EFTA nations sit alongside the EU. From there, the EFTA nations can delay, adapt, or veto legislation, either by claiming that it is not relevant to EEA nations, or that it triggers constitutional requirements. It is worth noting that between 1993 and 2011, Norway and Iceland have derogated from EU law on 400 occasions between them. And it is also worth remembering that less than a third of EU directives affect the EEA in the first place. Under Common Market 2.0, we would restore policy-making power in vast areas, including agriculture, 
fisheries, foreign security affairs, justice and home affairs, and taxation. Myth number three, that we have to pay more or less the same amount into EU budgets. This is wrong. We pay close to 50% per capita of what we pay now. Each EFTA EEA member pays only for the institutions and services that they access. And myth number four, that Norway doesn't want us. Well, the Norwegian Prime Minister has made clear her position. She has said, if, that, if joining EFTA is what the UK really wants, we will find solutions in the future. She also said, to find a good agreement, it is important for all European countries, and I hope that we will see an orderly deal that doesn't disrupt economic affairs in Europe. M myth number five, the EU don't support it. Well, in May 2018, Michel Barnier said, the only frictionless model for the future with the UK would be Norway plus. Norway being part of the single market plus a customs union. From the outset, Barnier made it clear that a Norway-style relationship would have been welcomed by the EU side, and it would not, but uh, that it was never explored properly because of our Prime Minister's red lines. Michel Barnier has also made clear that the EU was ready to negotiate the future, renegotiate the future relationship. In January, he said, if the United Kingdom chooses to change its red lines and to be more ambitious and go beyond a simple free trade deal in our future relationship, then the EU would be ready to do so immediately. So that's a flavor of the Common Market 2.0 proposal that we're putting forward. But how do we get there? How do we break the deadlock in Westminster? Well, I mean, there can be no doubt that our politics is both polarized and paralyzed. At one end of the spectrum, we have the People's Vote campaign fighting tooth and nail for a second referendum. And at the other side, we have the ERG, desperate for an ideological 19th century no deal. Brexit built on rainbows, unicorns, and Empire 2.0. But in all truth, it is not really Parliament that is the problem. The problem, of course, is the Prime Minister. It is her red lines that have tied our country up in knots. It is her stubbornness that has plunged us into this political and constitutional crisis by depriving the House of the opportunity to have a proper debate about the most important issue to face our country since the Second World War. The fact is that there has always been a cross-party parliamentary majority for a sensible, pragmatic, bridge-building form of Brexit. Our cross-party group of MPs has held very constructive and productive conversations with the leader of my party and his team, and we hope that we will be able to secure the Labour whip in support for a backbench-driven Common Market 2.0 motion or amendment. And if we can combine that Labour bloc vote with a sufficient number of Conservative MPs, and here I look to Rob and Nick, no pressure there, guys, uh, then we believe that we can get Common Market 2.0 over the line. Ladies and gentlemen, Britain is a great country, but we are more divided than we have been at any time in living memory. Young versus old, graduate versus non-graduate, city versus town. These divisions were not created by Brexit, but they were ruthlessly exposed at the ballot box in June 2016. Since then, the fault lines have deepened and widened to the extent that I believe that our country is in serious danger of tipping into a culture war. So it is time now for Parliament to step up and do its job. It's time for us to rediscover the lost art of compromise and to break the deadlock. It's time for us to find a way out of this mess. It's time to heal the wounds and to reunite our deeply divided country. Thank you. Stephen, thank you very much. That's a really... Uh useful overview of uh, the proposal, what it involves, how we might get there, uh, some of the strengths and, and appeal that you think it, think it has. I want to bring in the rest of the panel here um, and, and get some different perspectives on, on some of the issues and challenges that you've, you've put on the table there. Um, firstly, on this, on this question about influence, and Nick, maybe I could ask, ask this to you. Um, 
if, is the political test for Brexit about taking back control? And do you think common market meets that test? If you, uh, I accept that, that the, it's been a stable arrangement for the EFTA states um, uh, and, and worked pretty well for, for Norway and others. But if you speak to Norwegians and, and if you read what's been written by, uh, you know, for example, for, uh, for the Norwegian government about the compromise that Norway has ad adopted, they're you know, pretty open and honest about the limitations of the influence that they can have on uh, the process of legislation. In fact, you know, their, their view is that this, this is necessarily involves delegating a lot of legislative power to the EU. How does that meet the threshold for a return of sovereignty or taking back control or however you want to interpret uh, that uh, demand from the Brexit side? Yeah, no, well, it's an incredibly important question. And of course, it's not perfect because no compromise is ever perfect. But there are a few um, uh, sort of facts I'd, I'd like to highlight. The first is that I've been a member of parliament uh, since 2010 and I was a candidate in the 2005 election as well elsewhere. Um, and I represent a fairly a strongly leave voting constituency. I have never received a letter or an email or had a surgery appointment or a conversation with a single one of my constituents complaining about a single market directive. <laughs> never, not <laughs> once. So the question then is, what did they want to take control back of? Did they really want to take control back of the sorts of quite technical, quite nerdy, quite boring rules that govern an integrated market? Or did they want to take back control of the much more intensely political and indeed uh, sort of social and cultural uh, questions that come into play when you're talking about home affairs, justice, foreign, uh, defense policy, uh, or in my intensely rural constituency, did they want to take back control of our agricultural policy and our system of agricultural support? I very strongly believe that the extent to which we would actually not just take back control, but completely exit all of the EU's non-economic policies would be delivering an element of control that actually is much more the, the kind of control that people were looking for. The second thing to say is about Norway. If you talk to almost anyone in, the, in what the, um, this country uh, or the Daily Mail would call the, the elite uh, or the establishment, so anyone from a political party, any civil servant, any business leader in Norway, they're gagging to get into the EU. They're all desperate to get into the EU. But they're not going to get into the EU, and there's a simple reason why, which is that 65 to 70 percent of the Norwegian people are very happy with where they are, thank you very much. And they don't believe they're in the EU, and they don't believe that they've given up their sovereignty, and they're very happy with the halfway house that they have negotiated. And that is why this temporary position has turned out not to be quite so temporary. And if you talk to anybody who knows anything about Norwegian public opinion, they think there is not a single chance of the uh, Norwegian elite getting their way and getting into the EU. So clearly the Norwegian people think that it is an improvement. And the final thing to say, and it is really important, Stephen mentioned it, is that, of course, the whole point of the EEA is to align uh, policies with those uh, that have been adopted uh, by the EU as regards the single market. But there are exceptions. The Norwegians have not adopted a great number of single market legislation that they don't like. The Icelandics, actually, it's a much smaller country, have not adopted a great deal more. And there are some, you know, sometimes they just basically say we're not implementing it. And because it has no direct effect, unless it's been implemented locally, it doesn't apply. Sometimes they spin it out for five years. Sometimes they spin it out forever. And then what happens, well, what happens always in the EU is there's a negotiation. And there's a negotiation, and they agree to some derogation, to some exemption, to some way. Now, you, of course, you can't do that in the great majority of cases. If you did, the relationship would break down. But so long as you're doing it just when it really matters to you, actually, being in the EA gives you much more ability to resist legislation you don't like 
than, it, than you actually have in the EU, even though technically in the EU we have a vote. But once the vote has gone against us, it's imposed on us whether we like it or not. That is not true if you're in the EA. But, but in the EU, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting the way you framed that because it's ultimately about resisting the regulation rather than any capacity to have a positive role in legislating. Which I, and I'm, I'm, there's a couple of issues just to quickly um, be good to get your view on because originally, okay, f firstly, you're, you're sort of proposing that to some degree this, this sort of... Uh, deals with areas which are non-political anyway, or that, that, that people don't, don't sort of bring up to you in, in constituency concerns, et cetera. But isn't there a slight danger in, in basically seeking a solution which comes up with, it, which technocratizes, if I can use that as a verb, which is very ugly, um, but is a, is, a, is, is a technocratic, depoliticized version of lots of issues which the referendum sort of revealed people do care about. Trade policy, for example. Now, maybe people in, in Grantham don't come and talk to you about, I think actually that trade is deeply political in lots of ways because it affects uh, uh, jobs, competitiveness, distribution across the economy. Immigration is another. Now, I accept that, that there are certain measures within um, the EA that, that allow for um, the temporary suspension of, of freedom of movement, essentially. But is there a risk that, in effect, if, it, if we outsource some of those political questions, to the decision-making processes of the EU and we agree to basically try and influence them from the outside, that actually you produce something which isn't a very stable arrangement at all because you end up, uh, you know, you end up with a, a party at some point which will want to readdress all of these issues which haven't been addressed by leaving. No, I, I genuinely don't think there is that risk. I think these issues have only become uh, salient because of we, we did vote to, to, to leave the EU and then we've been arguing about them constantly for the last uh, two years. If you look at consistently all of the polls up until the referendum, what number in terms of people's top ten issues that matter to them, these sorts of issues never made it into the top ten for decades. What OBS we all know was the, the primary mover uh, of, uh, um, of the, um, uh, the referendum uh, result was a very serious and genuine concern. And there is a, you know, we're, we're not able to deliver everything if we do uh, go adopt the Common Market 2.0 about immigration mm -hmm. and about free movement. And that is a real challenge. And, you know, we, we, I think Stephen's right that the existence of the emergency break puts us into a much stronger position than we are in the EU. But it's still by no means a complete answer to people's concerns. But I simply don't believe that people are going to suddenly start worrying about the fact that single market regulation is one that, over which we don't have complete sovereign control. There was no evidence of that before the referendum. It wasn't, in fact, discussed during the referendum. It wasn't one of the main themes of the referendum, the, the, the single market directives and the way that in which they limit businesses' freedom. Nobody ever has complained about any of the international standards that we're signed up. You know, we all know that most industries are now governed by international standards that are set globally. Nobody ever complains about that because, frankly, who cares who decides how big the motor in your Hoover is? I mean, really not that many people. And, and that's why I think, that's what underlines or uh, underpins Nigel Farage, Boris Johnson, Dan Hannan, all of these people's support for EEA EFTA is because they recognised that it gave you control over the things that people care about and that it integrated the things that are uh, economically beneficial and that people don't care about. And that's why they supported it then. It's just that like every revolution, they become radicalised uh, having, having gained their result. You, you've also all been on a bit of a journey too, though, in that, that you, you've also in the past said things which were perhaps less, less of an endorsement of the Norway model than you than you might have now. So um, in that sense, maybe we can turn a little bit to these, these questions of sort of parliamentary arithmetic. Do you think you can persuade enough of your colleagues on the Labour side and the Conservative side to, to go on that same journey? And basically, because there is this, you know, the view earlier on was this, in effect, this presents the worst of both worlds rather than the best of both, because we're, we're, we're half in and half out, so we have less influence, but we still follow the rules, et cetera. And I, I, I accept that, that, that um, you, you disagree with all of those criticisms, but how do you persuade enough of your colleagues to go on that same journey that you have? 
Well, yeah, that is, that is what we're endeavouring to do at the moment. I mean, I used to be the director of Britain in Europe, which you, which you didn't mention in your introduction, when we were campaigning for Britain to join the euro. Some people in this room uh, will remember that campaign. And uh, I was on television regularly arguing with George Eustace and uh, Nigel Farage and others who were advocating Norway at that point. And I would say this is a terrible thing because you have no say and you, uh, you know, etc. all those arguments. Uh, so uh, the journey I have gone on is a considerable uh, one. Um, but that's because the time that we we are in and I think actually for all that we see on the TV and uh, all the reporting of the of this endless sort of awful um, Groundhog Day Brexit sort of vortex happening in the House of Commons right now is that many 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 members of Parliament and we're just representative of a few of them are desperately looking for the compromise and the way out of this situation. That has not been fully expressed uh, yet because we've not actually had the chance to express that other than through forums like this and, uh, and, and work that, that we're doing. But from leavers or Labour MPs who represent very strong leave seats, um, you know, who a year ago never would have considered uh, this option because of their concerns about sovereignty or free movement, which, which we've discussed, uh, through to uh, colleagues who desperately want us to remain, um, conservative colleagues, I mean, George, George Eustace, who recently resigned from the government because he doesn't want a delay. Uh, he supports not fully our proposal, but nearly all of our proposal, because he sees uh, exiting the EU uh, but staying in the EEA a way of actually reasserting some sovereignty and he sees it as a very speedy way of delivering Brexit. So there's a, and for Remain keep people who want to stay in the EU, I think this is the, you could describe this as a, the, you know, the economically most uh, closely aligned uh, version of, of, of of Brexit and for them who have ambitions of maybe rejoining at some point in the future this is this is the best way to do that so I think unlike most of the other options on the table although there aren't really let's be honest many other properly worked up and off that the shelf options that haven't well yeah or really that anybody's actually uh, pushing you know we believe we attract support from and we are attracting support from leavers and Remainers, Labour and Conservative and uh, the other parties. And that therefore we actually have a, an opportunity here, given the right circumstances and given the opportunity to express that, to command not just squeaking this over the line as all the other potential options uh, might have, but of, of achieving quite a sizable parliamentary majority uh, for, for this. And, you know, all, since we've sort of, well, Stephen's been banging on about this for ages. Uh, Nick, well. yeah, yeah. Nick, Nick's been banging on this about this for a medium term, and uh, Rob and I are the sort of uh, slight Johnny Come Latelys who who, who uh, co-authored the, the pamphlet earlier this year, which uh, Stephen and Nick actually really wrote, but we <laughs> we we help with. Um, but but you know, we everyone is looking for that compromise really, and. Uh, I think I think this is something that, that that could fly. Do you think the the SNP, the Lib Dems, the Greens, others who who beyond your own parties would who at the moment are much more enthusiastic the prospect of having a second referendum as a as a way to to break this impasse? Do you think they are persuadable on this question? Well, well, I hope so. I mean, look, the reality is that um, a second referendum is highly unlikely to happen. There just isn't the parliamentary mass there to support it. We had a vote on it uh, last week in Parliament. 334 MPs voted against it, and that was with, um, you know, the, the Labour Party uh, ab 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 abstaining on it. And there were other other people who would have voted against that at that, that point in time. So I, I just can't see see that happening. But obviously, I, I totally understand those who want to stay in the EU and want to have an expression for that. And that is a campaign that can continue beyond what happens over the over the next few weeks. So I hope that um, once that becomes clearer, people will recognise that this is the, the next best option. And, and Rob, perhaps I could ask you um, just on this question of, of immigration. Um, Article 112 provides in 
very specific circumstances, this is option for a, a effectively an, an emergency break potentially. Uh, so I suppose two two questions. One is, what do you think the wider political consequences of the UK unilaterally triggering an, an emergency break in that manner would have, either on the stability of the EFTA arrangements and more generally on the political relationship between the UK and the EU and EFTA member states? Um, and secondly, in terms of making this case for, uh, for Common Market 2.0, how much are you doing that on the basis that freedom of movement has plenty of benefits and that case maybe wasn't made enough during the referendum versus basically betting the house on the emergency break? Yeah, well, let me just give you a bit of context, if I may, before I answer the, the key points. And I come from a constituency that voted 68% to leave. It's a place where there is a lot of deprivation that people struggle with the cost of living. And although I voted Remain, I was a very reluctant Remain, and I voted Remain because I believe in alliances of democracies, but I didn't like the EU, I felt it was undemocratic. And, but I knew, and I predicted this on radio a few days before, I said my vote in my constituency <coughs> is going to be 70% to leave, because the way people were talking to me was that uh, if the polling station had been 20 miles away, they would have walked to the polling station to vote uh, uh, to leave the European Union. Uh, and it wasn't just because of freedom of movement, um, it was because of housing. So, for example, they, my town is a new town, they were promised uh, that everyone would have a council house and then they might see somebody from Eastern Europe move in next door in a council estate even though they can't get a house for their son and daughter. And it's not because of racism and the person from Eastern Europe may be renting or may have even bought the house, but that is the perception. They ring up the doctor, they wait two or four, three weeks for a doctor appointment, and then there might be somebody from Eastern Europe ahead of them uh, in the queue. Uh, they may have lost their jobs at Tesco Logistics, as many of my constituents did, having worked there for many years, because Tesco hired um, tem workers, um, temporary workers on the Swedish derogation uh, uh, more cheaply, um, and then moved the logistics side. So, this is where a lot of this comes from. It's not about racism. It's not about people didn't like immigrants because they welcome the immigrants that we have in our hospitals and they know that we need them uh, in, in hospitals and, and so on and so forth. And so I would never have come to this having promised my constituents after the day of the referendum that I would do everything possible to make sure uh, that I followed their wishes. I would never have come to this if I felt that one, there would be no control of freedom of movement, um, but also if it diluted um, the uh, idea that they would be withdrawing, uh, they would be withdrawing from the European Union. And when you, and I think uh, uh, Stephen touched on this, when you explain to people in my constituency, and by the way, uh, we are only 26 miles away from this building, my constituency, I live there, I have one home, I know it's very unusual for an MP, I genuinely live in my constituency, it is another world. It is another world, and it's 26 miles away, it is another world. And the people out there in the streets are incredibly angry with all of us. Mm -hmm. And they're very angry with politicians and parliament uh, and because they think we are not delivering on the referendum uh, result. And the potential is for things to become as toxic, in my view, as when there was the MP's expenses, uh, expenses uh, scandal. So I think we have to deliver on the referendum, and I genuinely believe that the important thing is that what the public, the, 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 the message of the Vote Leave campaign wasn't stop immigrants. I'm not talking about leave, dot leave. I'm talking about the moderate, more moderate Vote Leave campaign. The, med, the message was take control. And actually, with the articles, whether you would implement it or not, the key thing is you're saying to the public that actually you can take control. You can control freedom of movement um, if, uh, if you, if you, if you so, so require. And I think that is the crucial thing that allows me to explain to the public. And as, again, um, Stephen and Nick said, you are out of all the things that they hated, the political union, the, EC, the most part of the ECJ, the CFP, the, uh, the CAP, all the things that they thought, why on earth are we in a European Union? but you get the best of 
joining the European Free Trade Area. And I mentioned at the very beginning, I'll just conclude with this, is that I, voted, I said to you I voted for the EU because I believe in the alliance of democracies. Um, I wish this had been plan A, not plan B. Um, and it's true, I knew about EFTA, but I came to this view in the last uh, four or five months at the end of last year, having read, heard Nick, who is the guru of this, and spoken to Lucy and, and, and read a number of articles from David Owen. And then I saw that people like George Eustace resigned from the government, a hardcore principled, principled Eurosceptic, um, supported uh, membership of EFTA. Even Dan Hannan has, has been mentioned, still tweets about membership of EFTA, and I realized that it's possible to sell this to a very uh, um, uh, um, Eurosceptic public um, in certain areas of the country and to those kind of people who've been left behind. Even though this is, this is also EFTA plus, this is EFTA minus, the, minus the, the, the independent trade policy. Well, that is until your full membership of EFTA. So obviously people have different views about this, but you would, have, you would be part of a customs arrangement which would mirror the EU customs union until the frictionless border was solved. And then you would be uh, p potentially part of a uh, full part of the EFTA without the customs arrangement pillar. Until the frictionless border is solved. Yeah. <laughs> Just leave that there. Um, okay, enough questions from me. Let's go out to the audience. Um, if you could uh, introduce yourself, and uh, there's lots of Chatham House members here, so if you could say more than just a Chatham House member, that would be uh, useful. Um, yeah, if anyone wants a seat, seats are being pointed out at the front. Um, that would be great. So there's a, a question uh, here. Thanks. Uh, uh, George Peretz, a, a barrister from uh, Moncton Chambers. Uh, if I, uh, just a slight, <laughs> slight disagreement with Nick Bowles about the single market not being controversial. Sometimes it is. I mean, you take issues like animal testing on cosmetics or certain types of state aid decisions. You can get decisions that are quite controversial. Uh, I think the way I would put it is this. Sort of standing back a bit, the choice facing the United Kingdom is how do we live with this extraordinarily powerful regulatory regime which surrounds us effectively. And we can't ignore it, it's there. And in practice, for a whole variety of economic reasons, we're going to follow it. In the area of state aid, the government itself has already accepted we're going to have to follow the state aid rules, even on the uh, political declaration relationship that's been sketched out. Um, there really just isn't the option. The only coherent alternative option than working with the EU regulatory regime, which effectively means largely following it, is this Shankasingham group that effectively advocates joining the United States regulatory regime, which is bottom line what they, they are about. Um, and just frankly, it seems to me that their position is wholly politically unrealistic. Whatever you think about the merits of US regulation vis-a-vis -vis EU regulation, it just does not seem to be the British public are there. If you look at issues like GM food, beef hormones, all the chlorinated chicken stuff on, on agriculture, if you look at concerns about the NHS and the, um, the effect of a US trade deal on, on the NHS, it seems to me that our public opinion is pretty much European. So we're going to stay in the European regulatory area. The question is how do you manage that relationship? And the EEA is a well-established and fairly sophisticated way of running that relationship in a way that gives those countries that are outside the EU but are in that relationship, uh, some degree of control over matters that are important to them. No, I think, I mean, the thing that's exactly right, and the, uh, I'm so much aware that I know much less about this issue than George, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that we've actually asked George, and he has very um, uh, generously agreed uh, pro bono, uh, to help us redraft the political declaration on the future relationship. Point out that wasn't a planted question. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't know who that was. If it, if it had been planted, I wouldn't have suggested he told me I was wrong as the <laughs> opening. Um, uh, but, but, the, but the truth is, I think that's exactly the right uh, perspective on it. But again, on state aid, one of the reasons why, and you may have uh, seen that we in, in the last two weeks have had uh, two meetings uh, with the leader of the opposition and his key advisers, and one of the reasons I think it's fair to say why uh, the leader of the opposition is warming to this proposal is because what we've managed to explain to him that actually the state aid restrictions are not so bad 
that he can't do most of the things he wants to do. Now, I hope he never gets the chance to do those things, because I'm a conservative. But the truth is, you look at Norway, Norway spends more money per capita on state aid than any EU state. It's got nationalized railways, it's got nationalized post office, I think, and many other things. So the truth is that while, of course, we would have to accept these rules, and George is right, there, isn't, there is no regulation and standard-free uh, autarky available uh, to a modern nation state. You've got to, you've got to adopt one or the other uh, blocks uh, of standards. But within the EEA, there is enough flexibility to allow this country to be a truly self-governing sovereign nation. Yeah, we'll see. I, I, I did all that. I agree entirely with, with what's been said, but I, I do think that sometimes this whole debate gets blighted by um, the black and white nature of arguments uh, as presented, when in fact nothing about this is black or white. You know, being in the EU is not wonderful and amazing and we've got all this sovereignty and we've got all this influence to change all the rules and aren't we brilliant and then outside of it you know we have to have nothing to do with the, the rules at all and then this is like the worst of all worlds you know it's it's a gray it's a gray area inside the eu we're subject to qmv we very rarely kind of win those arguments anyway everything we have to uh, adopt automatically uh, I I in this country any version of brexit other than the one that George outlines, which is the sort of purest, flexi part of America. Any form of Brexit, from the Prime Minister's deal, being in a customs union, Jeremy Corbyn and Keir Starmer's version of Brexit, whatever it is, requires regulatory alignment and would require us to effectively adopt the single market regulation. So actually what we're saying is, let's have a voice, let's have an influence, let's have a, a veto, let's have some national uh, sovereignty over that, whilst also uh, leaving the EU and I just think that I think it's one of the things I learned from that Britain in Europe campaign when we wanted to join the euro we presented all the arguments as though joining the euro was just going to be absolutely wonderful and there were no downsides to, to, to creating a eurozone at all and then the one-size-fits-all interest rate which we sort of diminished at the time became the central problem for the eurozone which we had totally underplayed and we everything about this debate has got costs and benefits and we have to be honest about that and not just present arguments as entirely cost-free and benefit uh, plus or entirely the opposite. You would accept that not being able to, I mean, you mentioned obviously the, you know, the UK can be outvoted on issues which are decided by QMV, but not being able to vote versus being able to vote is a diminution of our influence and control well, over we, the design of legislation. Well, we vote in different ways. There's, there's consultative uh, you know, requirements. We have treaty rights within the EA EFTA. So, yeah, I mean, these are choices. And they're, it's a, it, what I'm saying is it's a sliding scale. Yeah. But the idea that you are either a rule maker or a rule taker and there's nothing in between is just nonsense. The, the EFTA court is very different from the ECJ court very different the impact it has on the countries in terms of the, the ECJ is an imposition court and the EFTA talk court is more of a guidance court. I think, I think the way I draw the distinction is that we would definitely be giving up influence over new rules being developed and applied to the whole of the EU. So we would have less ability to, to, to help shape the new rules that the EU adopts for everybody in the EU and the EEA. But I think we will have a greater ability to resist the application to us of deeply obnoxious rules. So it, the question is, which matters more to you? Is it that you want to have a huge amount of influence as a big player in the rules being developed for a whole continent? That's what used to be our main reason for being in the EU. We voted to leave the EU. And my argument would be, in the context of having voted to leave the EU, actually having a greater power to resist the application of the truly obnoxious things to our country without being able to stop them being applied to the others, that actually is, a, is something that is a more valuable thing given the context of the referendum and the, and the referendum vote. There are different kinds of influence. You know, it's apples and oranges, but we've already voted to leave the one kind, so the question is, is it worth retaining the other kind? And I think it is. Okay. Now, I need a question from a lawyer who isn't providing advice to the panel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Telling us we're wrong. Because, uh, yeah. uh, woman at the front. Uh, sorry, just actually the lady behind you. Sorry. Excuse me, sorry. 
Thank you very much. Emma Nicholson, um, former MEP, former MP, House of Lords. How can the panel um, see the future of the relationship with the European Union? The EU, as Giva Hofstadt said in this very room over a year ago, is in a great decline, but it hasn't yet finished its mission, which is the total enlargement. Given that the highest likelihood that is that we will leave, argument or no argument, in some form or other, how did the panel foresee us supporting the European Union in completing its mission and being as good as it possibly can be in its job of peace and security? Stephen, do you want to say that? Thank you very much, Emma. I, I, I think that's a, a really um, important question, and, and I touched on it a little bit in the speech based on what Macron is saying. Uh, you know, Macron is saying that for decades now, uh, the European Union has taken what you might describe as a one-size-fits-all, top-down approach to integration. And for decades now, leaders, not just Macron, many, many others, I mean, we've had everything. We've had a la carte, we've had multi-tier, we've had multi-speed, we've had variable geometry. Every single European leader I can remember said the EU needs to reform, and it needs to recognize that different member states are at different stages in their uh, evolution and in their uh, attachment or disattachment to attachment to or disattachment from uh, the European project uh, and I think that this you know there's no doubt that Brexit and the referendum was a massive reset moment for the United Kingdom but I think it could actually also be a reset moment for the EU because imagine if the United Kingdom were to join the EAF to countries you would create a new pole of influence uh, of uh, an intergovernmental relationship, counterbalancing the more supranational relationship that you certainly see in the Eurozone countries, and a recognition, I think, that there are a number of countries in the European Union that are never going to join the Eurozone. They're never going to have that deeper political, uh, fiscal, or monetary union, uh, but want a frictionless trading relationship with this incredible jewel in the crown of European integration, which is the single market. What an amazing achievement, how much, what it's delivered in terms of growth and opportunities for our economies. So I think that what, if we had some imagination and some innovation and some creativity in all of this, we could actually see the opportunity of the UK joining uh, EEA EFTA as an opportunity also for the EU to catalyze and kickstart the reform that is so desperately needed. I believe in this option because I'm a passionate pro-European. I want the European project to succeed. But in order for it to succeed, it has to reform. It has to change. It needs a new architecture. It needs to be re-engineered. And it, that's never going to happen if, there's, if, if it's just this bias to inertia and nobody ever changes anything and nothing ever... You know, sometimes you do actually have a positive changing effect by stepping away and influencing from the outside rather than being on the inside and, and part of the kind of groupthink. So I, you know, I, I, th my, I think the answer to the question is, yes, reset moment for the United Kingdom, but let's also capitalize this potentially a, as an opportunity for a positive, progressive reset moment for the European project as well. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so there's a question here at the front. Hi, I'm Adam Pern, a political reporter at Business Insider. I just have two questions. Firstly, in light of the events of the last few hours, I guess, that the Prime Minister looks like she's going to uh, request a short extension of around three months and press ahead with plans for meaningful vote three, four, five, whatever. Um, and um, the idea, as far as I can tell, has been that the route to Common Market 2.0 is the Commons is given increased control of this process, perhaps through indicative votes. Um, is that still the plan? And if so, what is the route to that in terms of parliamentary procedure in the weeks ahead? And secondly, Stephen and Nick, um, you said that talks with Jeremy Corbyn seem to have gone pretty well. Uh, can you reveal what the outstanding issues are? And um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll answer the quest one question that you've asked, okay. which is um, about the extension. Um, we're obviously not going to reveal the, the state of private conversations. Um, uh, the extension of three months, um, I think we do need to be... I mean, I'm literally the Prime Minister's greatest critic in the Conservative Parliamentary Party, so I'm not in the business of defending Theresa May. But sh her motion last week did not ask MPs to support a long extension. If you read it, and I read it at the time, it said 
it noted that the EU Council is likely to ask, or to insist rather, on a long extension if we uh, 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 don't pass the deal next week. It just noted it. it never, we never voted for a long extension. We have always been very clear that one of the great advantages of Common Market 2.0 is that we can get it done in three months. We can get the political declaration changed. George has already written half of it. Uh, and, oh, and, 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 and I'm sure. And, <laughs> and, uh, Alan well, Al, <laughs> uh, Alan and George have written half of it. And the EU you know, reiterated literally yesterday, Barnier reiterated that the future relationship, uh, the political declaration could be uh, renegotiated very quickly. Uh, and then we would have a couple of months to get the uh, withdrawal uh, implementation bill through. So this is the only alternative to the Prime Minister's deal that can be done in the time that we're going to have. But it, wouldn't it have to be done, basically, you would need political agreement within Westminster by basically the middle of April to yeah. avoid having to uh, go through the process of organising European elections, etc. So you think that, that I think this consensus well can be the, reached I think by you'd need to be well on the way to getting that consensus. You wouldn't necessarily need to have formally passed a withdrawal agreement and a new political declaration. But I think that if you would need to have shown that you had a majority for the principle of a renegotiated political declaration and that Parliament would then vote for the withdrawal agreement if that was achieved. I think you need that by middle of April. If the second referendum has gone by then, I hope that if there is another vote that it will be voted down, which I'm sure it will be, um, then where are most moderate MPs going to go in terms of this idea if there are indicative votes? Where, and I actually believe that this will get a huge amount of support from my side of the House and from uh, Lucy's and, and Stevens, because what are people going to vote for other than um, the Morehouse um, Declaration, which is not going to be accepted um, in any way by the EU? And just on the, quickly on Adam, we will be seeking time, parliamentary time, to have a debate and a vote on this. So ne next week, uh, there'll be a retabling in some form of the Hillary Benn Amendment. That's going to happen. OK, thanks. Um, there's a question here. Uh, Thomas Cole, Head of Policy at the People's Vote Campaign and formerly an international negotiator for the European Commission, including on Iceland. Uh, you mentioned that this is uh, kind of an off-the-shelf agreement, but let's be honest about it, it's not. There's the EEA and there's the Customs Union, but there's no third country which is both at the moment. So I'm wondering, how long in your mind did this take to negotiate? Well, we might ask George. It's... <laughs> <laughs> It's not all in all in one go. I mean, I think the the advice from uh, George and others, and and indications that we've had from from Europe and elsewhere, is that asserting our current treaty rights it, as members of the EEA and remaining in the EEA but via the EFTA pillar, so to speak, that could be done relatively quickly. We could be there by the summer, and then we would use the rest of the transition period to uh, negotiate the. Um, comprehensive customs arrangements, security issues, and some of the other uh, issues to go on to, that, that need to be um, negotiated. I think what the last couple of years have really emphasised, uh, and we knew this already, didn't we? I mean, um, this, is, this was an issue during the referendum campaign, is that the free trade arrangements, bespoke free trade arrangements negotiated with Europe, take an absolute age. That is the hardest bit of uh, the negotiations. Um, Liam Fox, Boris Johnson and others all told us the, this would be the easiest uh, free trade negotiation ever done. Um, well, that, that, was, that was lol, wasn't it? Um, that's not actually happened at all. So the, 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 I think the, the bulk of what needed to be negotiated uh, in that transition period would be relatively straightforward by going into, into the EA. But you're right, there still would be the customs arrangement uh, part of that, security and, and some other elements. But, and the but we would. From that, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So just, so just, to, but, just but question, to be clear on this. We'll have the transition till December 2020. So the question is not can we negotiate this by the end of June? Uh, it's can we negotiate this? It's can we negotiate this by December 2020? And the indications are that that should be possible, whereas we discovered that the, the crucial flaw in the Prime Minister's plan is that everybody knows she's not going to have got her 
deal negotiated by December 2020, hence the backstop, hence all of the problems we're in. So can I ask, um, is the expectation, and I don't know if you, you all have a completely shared view on this, in if these negotiations are successful in the way that you want them to be, what is, what is the trading relationship between the UK and the EU? Are we in a customs union formerly with the EU and therefore there is no customs border visible or invisible on the island of Ireland? Are we in EFTA and have distinct trade arrangements and an independent trade policy separate from the EU? Okay, so one of the <laughs> arts of politics is identifying those things you agree on and I recognizing those things you disagree on. Now, I think everybody in this room would agree that there is simply no chance in hell of alternative arrangements that guarantee frictionless trade and no hard border on the island of Ireland being ready and agreed to by the EU before the next election, which is in 2022. So, what does that mean? It means that all of us, from Rob who wants to get into EFTA as a full-blown member of EFTA, signed up to all of EFTA's free trade agreements, and therefore obviously outside the customs uh, union, the customs territory uh, with the EU. Uh, Rob accepts that until 2022, we're gonna need to be in a customs arrangement with the common external tariff. Jeremy Corbyn, who wants a permanent customs union, the SNP, who want a permanent customs union, Ply Kimmery, who want a permanent customs union, they also accept that there's no chance of those alternative arrangements being ready before the next election. So what we have is the potential to form a compromise where everybody agrees that we're going to be in a customs arrangement with a common external tariff until those alternative arrangements are ready. We can all then go into the next election. The Labour Party will say, we'll stay in a permanent customs union forever. So will the SNP, so will the Lib Dem, so will the op other opposition parties. The Tories, maybe, depending on who their leader is, will say, we're going to get those alternative arrangements, and as soon as we do, we're going to join EFTA fully. So we don't need to decide now where we're going to be in 2022. What we need to decide is how do we go from here to 2022. And on that, actually, you can build agreement. And we have in a, a draft motion that we've been circulating and discussing with everybody, uh, but isn't yet public, we have a form of words that everybody can live with, except for the most hardline Brexiters, who, of course, don't even want to be in a temporary customers arrangement for a couple of years. OK, so it's partly parking that question and exactly. building the bridge. OK, um, I'm going to try and take uh, a couple of questions now, because we've, we've got about eight or nine minutes left. Um, there is one question at the back there. Uh, thank you, panel. My name's uh, Sam. I'm here in a personal capacity. I'm a Conservative Party member. I voted Brexit. I'm from London. I went into the referendum Remain. I didn't even ask for a referendum. But I had to make a choice. And it was a lack of reform in that package that tipped me and I think many of our countrymen and women uh, into the Leave camp. Um, I've heard you on today. I've read your pieces in The Times. Um, your persuasion today is infectious, uh, and I'm on board. But for all the conversation about Parliament and the stakeholders in this room, I'm not hearing much from you in how you're going to take this message out to the wider country on what are quite nuanced, technically complicated things. So here's my question. How are you going to use the power of persuasion to build compromise and unite this uh, United Kingdom? Um, and what are the plans over the next days and months to do that? Okay, thanks. Just yeah. hold that for one second. I'm just going to grab an extra question because we've not got too much time left. There's a gentleman right at the back. No, thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Adrian Yelland. Uh, to go back to something that Stephen said right at the very beginning, how important is it to understand that there are in fact two jurisdictions within the EEA and that you have the European Union as one jurisdiction and EFTA as another? So it's not a pillar, it's a jurisdiction. And that the EU is a supranational jurisdiction and EFTA is an intergovernmental jurisdiction which respects uh, and upholds national sovereignty. Thanks. Um, Rob, would you like to take this first question about yeah. making the case to the country? Yeah, well, I think... Uh, you made possibly one of the most important questions, um, and I was trying to explain to you in my uh, my remarks um, 
about uh, the, the feeling of the people in my constituency um, and how we reach out to them. I think the, before we can do anything in terms of the wider public, we have to convince Parliament um, that this is the, is the right option. But you're absolutely right. What we need is a grassroots campaign which says that we are taking back control because that's what people wanted. That's why the Leave campaign was so successful. But at the same time, safeguarding uh, jobs and businesses, which people are very concerned on, because in my area, people have moved from skepticism about the Prime Minister's deal to kind of real anxiety about wanting to get this done and wanting uh, uh, things to, to, mo to move on. But we will uh, uh, need a grassroots campaign to set out um, what the membership of EFTA brings. And it takes back control. It means we aren't closing uh, the drawbridge. And there are simple messages. And we're out of uh, uh, the political union. And I think those are simple messages that we can get across to the public. But as uh, Stephen set out at the beginning, we are just a, a motley crew uh, at the moment. And we don't have the uh, uh, the, the, money the, 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 the money of the people's vote campaign. The money of the people's vote campaign, or the money of the, uh, or the, or the ERG. But uh, in order to convince the public that this is delivering the referendum result, which is key, and I wouldn't be supporting it if I didn't think so, uh, um, the grassroots campaign is going to be incredibly important. And perhaps you might offer yourself as one of the coordinators uh, if, it, if it happens. I mean, this is not purely a recruitment exercise. Yeah. 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 Uh, can, I, just, can I just add, add to that briefly? Because my constituency is a, um, a very Remain constituency. It's a Labour Remain uh, constituency as well, sort of metropolitan, although the outer ring of my constituency is much more like, like Rob's too. So um, you know, I feel both those things. But I, I have had no problem in selling this to my constituents either at all and i've had many meetings about it lots of you know uh, correspondence emails exchange i've done lots of local uh, media on it as well and uh, you know, that that's what i think has has meant that we are where we are with it now at this at this point because uh, it is something that that both sides can can get behind and there's very few of those options there so even though many of my constituents really just want us to stay in the EU and just want to stop this whole thing and get off um, they um, will very quickly say to me but I can see that this this is the the best thing otherwise this is the I could live with this uh, lots of people will say I can live with it and there have been lots of public opinion studies done where people have been taken through the issues and so on there was one just published this week by um, my old University King's College, where they you know, took many people through the arguments, and this was clearly, nearly 50% of people said this was their preferred option of all the other options sort of on the table. So I think it's something that would, would, we could sell very straightforwardly. Okay, so, um, I'm gonna try and get in three more questions. Just on, just on ECJ. Oh, um, sorry, yeah, yeah, if just, just yeah, the, uh, the answer Quick is clarification. absolutely yes. I mean, there's a key difference between supranational and intergovernmental courts, two very different jurisdictions. I, and I ab absolutely agree, by the way, on the, the, the huge frustration that we've had. Is that I believe that this is a solution that has been hiding in plain sight for two years. And because of the tremendous noise, and I pay compliment to the People's Vote campaign, they have made a huge amount of noise. They've delivered 400,000 people on the streets. I just regret that if, I mean, if we'd had 0.1% of the resource that we could have put into this campaign, I think we could have genuinely given it a voice and we could have had that public engagement. But it's not too late. Uh, we've got to now find a way of debating it properly in Parliament. Incredibly frustrating that the Prime Minister hasn't given us the opportunity to do so. But, you know, it's we're here today and we hope that this will be the first step uh, towards actually getting more public engagement. Do you think, just very quickly, you can have that grassroots movement if it's everybody's second choice and nobody's first choice? I think that there is an appetite in the country for compromise. That people are sick and tired of this binary debate, as Lucy touched on earlier. People know that the world is a complicated place. They know that we've struggled to find a way through this uh, and that compromise in general, in life, is the way that you get through uh, complex and challenging situations. So I think there's something in there about uh, tapping into that uh, desire for finding a solution, uh, uh, stopping the trench warfare, 
and moving the country forward. So yeah. I, I hope that we can do that. I think the way to sell it is about rediscovering the, last of the lost art of compromise. Okay, last couple of questions very quickly. Uh, there's one gentleman at the front here. Sorry, who I missed off last time. Yep, go on. Hi, uh, Tom Just Burrell. It's got to be really Very quick. quickly, from King's College. I think the idea is great. Uh, lots of ideas have come out. I would be more interested to hear about how we're actually going to get there and what the probability you think of us doing so. So really, the practicalities more than the idea, I think, would be really important to hear about. Okay, thanks. And this is the last question, so definitely make it a good one. Um, sir, here. Thank you. Eduardo Torina, Deborah Voice in Plimpton. Um, just very quickly, sometimes the Brexit debate in these two years has been a bit insular, I think it's fair to say. And I fear that we might run the risk of doing this again, even in the context of Common Market 2.0. I've heard a lot about how the UK, you know, this would be a great solution because effectively the UK would have the chance every now and again to frustrate, you know, what the EU was trying to do, be it through the use of this emergency break, which I personally don't see how it could be used given the circumstances in the UK, or by effectively you know, refusing to adopt legislation. If I was a policymaker in an EFTA state, I would be very concerned about this. And I think that a knock on effect on that is that when you actually come to sit down and negotiate this, you know, you might find that it's actually a lot, a lot harder to negotiate than you would initially thought. So I'd be curious to hear okay. your Thanks. thoughts. That's, very much, that's, that's great. So um, two questions, one on the practicalities and one on this absolutely crucial question. Is this negotiable with the EU states and the EFTA states? Does F, do the EFTA states want a, a, a kind of a big, a big brother joining the club in a way that, you know, our politics hasn't advertised stability and security very much in the last yeah. few weeks. So it's a crucial question. So and then any final remarks you I want on this first one? I mean, quickly on the practicalities. I mean, if we 100% if we knew that, <laughs> uh, we all wouldn't be here right now, would we? Um, because this is a case of sort of feeling our way through to, to some extent. What we are working incredibly hard at as a group and as a wider group that we uh, represent is to... Uh, nudge everyone in Parliament sort of towards this towards this uh, outcome, and I think we've done a, a, a very good job of that actually over, over the last few months. I think really now we are getting to the point where um, the choices are really the the, the Prime Minister's deal, um, a second referendum, which um, you know is is not really going to happen, a No Deal, which is also hopefully not going to happen because Parliament doesn't want it to, although it, it, it might do otherwise or this is the other option. And I think, you know, being, you know, the, the process has to enable the political solution. And what we're concentrating on really is the political solution. And that, that takes uh, everyone to so agree to. Okay. So uh, we, 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 yeah. we're really short on time and yeah. I just want to so this is get really, to this really question. really important point. And I just, it's very important that we don't uh, misstate or overstate our case. None of us are saying that there's any immediate likelihood that we will want or be able to pull the emergency brake on immigration. All we are saying is this. One, that David Cameron, in his attempted renegotiation of our EU membership, took the exact words of Article 112, 113 and 114 of the EEA agreement to the EU and said, this is what I want. The exact same words. And the EU refused it point blank. Why? Because it has a potential value. It's there as a safeguard, as a, to coin a phrase, backstop. It's not something you would use in normal circumstances. It's not something that could be used and maintained for very long. Uh, but l imagine if Ukraine were to join the EU and free movement were to apply from the, get the, the start. And imagine that Ukraine was going through a bad economic period and that the UK was doing very well and its, its labor market was very buoyant that in a circumstance where, as with Poland in the early 2000s, you had many, many hundreds of thousands of people moving in a single year into the UK, that's the sort of circumstance where most people accept that the emergency break might be possible to be used. And that could be a great source of reassurance to the British people that they're never going to be put back in that situation again. Because as you've seen, immigration currently is at levels that you know, both the, the concern has come down and the level of immigration has come down from the European Union, and we've still got freedom of movement is in full force. 
So it, it, it's just about, as Rob said, giving people a sense of greater control. On resisting uh, regulations, there I don't entirely agree with you. Of course, the whole point of being in the EA is to try and uh, integrate and to, to try and uh, a, a, a align our rules. But, but Norway, every single year, and Iceland, every single year, there's one or two that they resist. There are uh, 300 legislative acts that Norway and Iceland, between them, have not adopted. And all that one is saying is that in extremists, in the place where you can't negotiate an acceptable solution, that there is an ability to resist. That doesn't mean that you're going in there with a wrecking ball, trying to smash it all up. It simply says that in extremists, in exceptional circumstances, we have the right to resist. And I think that that will be reassuring to people. It doesn't mean that we're going to come along and upset their, their very happy uh, situation. Far from it. We want to benefit from it. Thanks. Thanks. And uh, Rob, you wanted to Can make I a final point? just make a very quick point. I think also underlying your question was that are we joining this basically saying on all the things we don't have to do. But actually, I tried to, in my remarks, mm. say I believe in this because I believe in alliances democracies. Mm. The Norwegian Prime Minister, the Iceland Foreign Minister has welcomed the idea of Britain joining. I think it would be great for the geopolitical balance of Europe. It would be a good counterweight to uh, uh, the EU um, and I think it would be good for the EFTA countries if Britain was belonging. It would be good for the United Kingdom and good for the balance of power in Europe. And that is one of the reasons, as a believer, I'm a in liberal interventionist, I believe in alliances of democracies. And that's one of the reasons why I think this is a very exciting option for the United Kingdom, not just because we're able to derogate from this or that or not uh, part of the political thing, but in order to sell it to the public, as the gentleman at the back said, we have to explain that we're delivering the referendum result. Thank you very much.